Hello, my health freedom loving friends. Misty Carlfeld here with Health Freedom Idaho. I'm here with Scott Cleveland, who's running against Mike Simpson for Congress. Thank you so much for joining me, Scott. Hey, it's great to have uh, a chance to be on your show, Misty. Thank you very much. Well, let's talk first about kind of all things health freedom. Where do you stand on health freedom in general? Where, how about lockdowns, masks, vaccines? Where do you stand on those fundamental uh, bodily autonomy and health freedom issues? Yes, well, I'm very much aligned with your platform. I'm familiar with your work and I appreciate all that you do. I'm, I'm an anti-force uh, vaccination, anti-lockdown, anti-mask guy. If somebody wants to wear a face diaper on their face, that's fine with it. Uh, fine with me if they want to wear it, but nobody should be forced uh, the lockdowns, the COVID madness. I'm glad most of that is behind us, but uh, never give these people a chance to implement their draconian measures again. Amen to that. Right. Now you've been, you have ran for several years, right? How long have you been working at this? Well, uh, some of your, uh, some of your viewers might recognize my name. I, I ran two years ago for the U S Senate seat held by Mike Crapo. And while we were unsuccessful in that endeavor, uh, two things came out of it. Uh, we got, gathered valuable contacts all over the state of Idaho. And, uh, you know, we uh, got a really good experience out of it. I think that you have to know what you're doing if you're going to run a large campaign. Uh, you mentioned it earlier. I'm running for the United States House of Representatives in Congressional District 2 against the 25-year uh, incumbent, Mike Simpson. And I'm sure we'll get into his track record here a little bit at some point. Oh my goodness! I saw it everywhere. <laughs> We've been working hard at it. That's for sure. Put my glasses well, I, on. I can tell. I can tell you're working hard at it, and I appreciate your work. I see your signs everywhere. I live in Meridian, and your signs are oh. everywhere. And I, it makes me smile every time, uh, because listen, Mike Simpson. Oh my gosh, yeah. he is the swamp. He's been there for far too long, from what I can tell. Right. Uh, I've been to Washington D.C. one time. Um, his office was one of the least hospitable uh, right. offices to Health Freedom Idaho. And I have no doubt that if I had wanted to visit him uh, during 2020 to 2021, sure. he would have required a mask, which I would not have done. And yeah. so it sounds to me like we would have access to you, Scott, which really yeah. is important for the people. Am I right? Well, a lot of people don't realize that Congressional District 2 is, of course, all of eastern Idaho. It comes to a point right here in the Treasure Valley, uh, and it, it makes up about half of Ada County. So it's 25 and a half counties. The cutoff line is basically Eagle Road. If you live east of Eagle Road, you're probably in Congressional District 2. If you live on the other side, that most of Meridian is, in fact, in Congressional District 1, Russ Fulcher's district. Okay. So what, what inspired you to run in general, and what inspired you to switch and, and go against Simpson? Well, um, a couple of things, you know, and I hate to give such a short answer to a, an important question. Why I decided to run is pretty straightforward. The people that are running our country now, Misty, they suck at it. They're doing a horrible job of running this country. And I think people realize it, but there aren't, aren't that many people that are, uh, number one, willing to run for high office or capable of pulling something like this off. And, and I, I like to think that I'm, I'm both. And, and that's really what inspires me. That's that's the short answer. There's a lot of moving parts to a campaign this size, but uh, I have a great team behind me. Uh, you mentioned my website and some of the things we have there. Uh, but it's just my desire to to make things better for the average American citizen. Our representatives in Washington, D.C., they don't really represent average Americans. They represent lobbyists and special interest groups and big business. And that's got to change if we're going to save the country from the direction that it's headed. Yeah. yeah. And so why Simpson specifically? What, okay, what well, has he been doing that you're not happy about? Well, uh, so Mike Simpson, um, you know, like I said, he's been in office a long time. And for the record, I have nothing personal against Mike Simpson. There was a time many years ago when he voted like a true conservative Republican. Well, that time has passed. And there's really three things that uh, uh, have me wound up about Mike Simpson in particular. Uh, number one, is his horrible voting record. Uh, I follow this publication called The New American. It's almost like the Heritage Foundation, if you're familiar with that. And they put out something each year called a Freedom Index, and they measure all 535 members of Congress. They look at their voting record, and they, and they measure it against national issues on, in the terms of 
is this representative's uh, votes, number one, constitutional? And secondly, are they conservative, truly conservative? And Mike Simpson, in the January edition of the New American uh, Freedom Index, scores just a 45 out of a possible 100. That's Democrat territory. There are Democrats with higher scores than that. That's not me saying his voting records that way. That's people that are in the know. By comparison, in the same index, our other congressman, Russ Fulcher, scores a 90 in the same index. So it is possible to have somebody that actually votes like a, a true conservative. Uh, the, the other issue is, of course, the dam issue. Mike Simpson is leading the charge in Washington, D.C. to remove the four dams on the lower Snake River. That is a horrible, disastrous policy decision on many levels. Uh, he's a man on an island himself trying to do that. Uh, our governor does not want the dams to come out. The rest of our members of Congress do not want the dams to come out. If you're in the ag industry, you don't want the dams to come out. And anybody that pays an electric bill certainly doesn't want the dams to come out. And the last thing before I get off my soapbox about Mike Simpson that really has me chapped these days is he has not bothered to hold a single campaign event in Idaho this year. That's how little he thinks of the voters of Idaho that he's supposed to represent. He has not made a single public appearance anywhere in the state of Idaho to campaign for his reelection. He takes us all for granted, and I, uh, I'm against that uh, mindset. Uh, he thinks he's the anointed one, and Idahoans deserve better than that in terms of representation. Wow. Wow. Wow, thank you for all of that. That's so important and I, and I couldn't agree more. I'm gonna show your website because I was super impressed by it um, and, and really your focus on, um, on the dam issue right here. Here's your, your website and um, first thing you talk about uh, water and power and you're opposed to the removal of the four lower Snake River dams and advocating right. for increased storage on existing dams. Sure. Um, and then you can click on that and get more information, you know, over here, water and power. And then also there's this um, quick facts that you have that are mm -hmm. absolutely mind blowing. And I'm gonna share this on Health Freedom Idaho today. Yes. So yes, for people who are worried about clean energy, right. from what I can read and, and, and understand, um, the dams produce a lot of clean energy. Am I right? 90% uh, of the Pacific Northwest energy comes from hydroelectric power. Uh, specifically, these four dams that they're talking about removing produce 65% of the region's electricity, uh, just those four dams. Uh, Missy, the crazy thing is this, uh, in order to replace the amount of energy from these four dams that Simpson wants removed, you would have to build two nuclear plants or three coal-fired plants or six natural gas-fired plants just to break even on the amount of electricity uh, produced by those dams. We know those things are not going to happen. They're not going to approve any nuclear plants anytime soon. Uh, coal is not the cleanest of energy sources. And Idaho is not blessed with natural gas uh, in large quantities. So uh, it's a disastrous policy decision. It really has very little to do with uh, the salmon. I, I like to call it the salmon reparations. It's just another uh, shakedown of the American taxpayers. And uh, Simpson's going along with it uh, to his detriment. Wow. wow. And so for those who are concerned about food sovereignty, how will the if you breach the dams, how will that affect the water for the farmers and our eventual our food sovereignty in general? Well, there, there's two issues there, of course. Um, you have the electricity issue, which we already talked about. Electric rates could easily triple. Um, but in, in Idaho, let's face it. I mean, the ag industry is what our whole state is, is driven off of. And it doesn't matter whether you're up north near, near the port of Lewiston. They grow a lot of wheat up in that area or you're down in the Snake River Valley where they grow just about everything else. Uh, the port at Lewiston specifically is the furthest inland port in America. And much of the agricultural uh, byproducts, you know, the, the commodities, if you will, are sent by trucks, 18 wheelers from the Snake River Valley and North Idaho, and they go on barges and they're, uh, they're shipped, uh, you know, downriver out to the Pacific Ocean to Asian markets and around the world. Well, 
just to fill up one barge, this is a very economical way of shipping goods, by the way, to fill up one barge, it takes 140 18-wheeler trucks. That's how big those barges are. So if they take out the dams, the Port of Lewiston would close, and now those same commodities have to get to the West Coast some other way, probably by an 18-wheeler. So you're increasing the, the cost of the growers to transport their goods. And when they're not going to absorb those costs, they're going to pass on higher food cost, in very inflationary. Uh, and that's part of the reason it's it's such a disaster. Uh, but the feds are the feds are uh, not good at uh, making good decisions. If they take out those four dams, there's nothing preventing them from coming up the Snake River and taking out more dams in the name of you know fish reparations. Currently, the bull trout is a listed species, as is the cutthroat trout. And the the thing that voters in Idaho really need to be concerned about is this. If Mike Simpson is reelected and God forbid Joe Biden is still in the White House or one of his minions, there is a good, good chance those dams are coming out. And that is not a chance that people in Idaho can afford to take. And how will it affect water to farmers? Well, uh, when they start tearing out the dams, your water storage and the, and the, the water flows and recharging the aquifer, all of those things go down. Uh, currently, our growing demands, we need more water storage, not less water storage. And instead of removing dams, I propose we build another one. There's a, there's a place down near Twin Falls along uh, near the Snake River Valley where there's another proposed new dam uh, that would not be an environmental problem. We could put one in there. I'd also propose that we rebuild the Teton Dam that collapsed many years ago. Only this time we should build it out of concrete instead of mud like they did last time. Uh, that would help uh, recharge the aquifer and everything downriver along the Snake River Valley is very, very important. I've had a chance to meet with the water board in Water District 1, which is the most important water district in the state of Idaho. And uh, they're all against those dams coming out as well because the water quality, as you mentioned, without quality water, they can't grow their crops and it has to be protected at all costs. So it's really an interesting discussion because I was at the um, the Tribal Food Sovereignty Summit mm -hmm. and I heard their very compelling point of view about the salmon and that the salmon can't, um, they can't be prolific because of these dams. Can you speak to that? Well, I'm not a fish biologist. But I've been studying this issue quite a bit since I started running, and I'd like to direct your uh, your listeners to a, to a website. Uh, the website is cfpfd.org, cfpfd.org, and it stands for the Citizens for Preservation of Fish and Dams. Uh, this website uh, it has the best resources and educational materials about the complexities of salmon populations. And this one is run by fish biologists. There you go. That is a great screenshot of it. Uh, there are several places you can click along in here. There's uh, educational videos on YouTube and so on, right, right from this website. And I'll just summarize. Uh, salmon populations do fluctuate. They go up and they go down. And while the dams may have a, a factor in that, it's not the primary reason that salmon populations uh, fluctuate year over year. It is a very complex issue, but I'll summarize. Part of the problem is the uh, foreign fishing fleets out in the Pacific Ocean catch a lot of salmon with their long lines. The fish that make it past there uh, come up the Columbia River, and some of them uh, are eaten by sea lions, so you have that going on. Uh, the Native American tribes they have unlimited fishing rights on the on the salmon, adult salmon that make it up, and they haul a lot of salmon out of there and they sell them on the roadside. Uh, I'm not saying that they shouldn't have those rights, but there there might be limits on the amount of catch that goes on. Uh, and then and then you have the dam issues as you as you come over. So uh, it's not it's not just because of the dams. There are a lot of reasons the populations. Uh, fluctuate and the salmon do make it up today. It's not like salmon don't make it all the way up into Idaho today. They still do, but I would support uh, measures that are reasonable that are not economically disastrous, like removing the dams. 
So one of the points that they made there was that if you remove the dams, that you could replace the power by using solar um, panels and putting solar panels on roofs. Um, can you speak to that? Are you familiar with the trade of dam energy versus um, solar power energy? Yeah, no, you can't replace that amount of clean hydropower with solar panels. It's just not feasible. You'd have to basically carpet half of the state of Idaho with solar panels to even come close to making up what, what would be lost from these hydroelectric dams. So uh, that's a bit of a stretch. I'm not a fan of uh, the solar panels being uh, installed uh, in thousands of acres here in the West just because. And I also object to these giant windmills. Every time I'm on the campaign trail in Congressional District 2, every time, including yesterday, coming back from Bonneville County, uh, we see these uh, giant windmill blades being trucked through. Now, most of them currently are being trucked through to, you know, Montana or Canada or somewhere else. Uh, but those things are, are an environmental disaster waiting to happen. Uh, I call them sky blenders. You know, they chop up our birds of prey here in Idaho pretty regular, and yet, and yet they're still being installed. Now, there's a big project in southern Idaho called the Lava Ridge Project, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. And supposedly that project is on hold. Well, I wouldn't go uh, betting the house on that just yet. If, if the Native American tribes are successful at removing these four Snake River dams or get a large multi-billion dollar payout, there is a real good chance that that BLM project uh, known as Lava Ridge uh, the uh, windmill project, there's a good chance that that moves forward. That project is not dead. It's only on hold. And nobody in Idaho wants that, but the feds are pushing it anyways. Can you explain that billion dollar payout? If that would be to the tribes? Why? Well, if you look at who's funding Mike Simpson's campaign on the federal election website, you will see large donations from Native American tribes across the country, not just Idaho tribes. And what's driving that is... Uh, I hate to be such a cynic, but much of what goes on in Washington these days is a giant taxpayer funded money laundering operation to one special interest group after another. In this case, the Native American tribes. The tribes see those salmon uh, populations as their, their, their property to do with it what they see fit. And because uh, the declining and fluctuating populations of salmon, they've been suing the federal government for decades and getting payouts uh, in terms of reparation. And I just see that trend continuing. They're not really interested in saving the fish so much as getting billions of dollars uh, in settlement costs. And, and that's what's driving that. It, it has very little to do with the actual salmon populations. And Mike Simpson is being funded by these tribes across the country. And, th and that's what you see going on there. Wow. wow. Okay, well, that was a lot to take in, Scott. <laughs> it, is. it is. Well, I appreciate you running. Is there anything else that you want to tell your district about that we can, you know, share right now? Well, I think, uh, you know, just directing people to our website. I mean, if we're going to have meaningful change in Washington, D.C., it's not going to come from our current representation. And, you know, people need to do their own research. I like to joke around in, in Idaho when, when people see an R beside a candidate's name, they often think that stands for Republican. In my mind, when I see an R beside a candidate's name in Idaho, it stands for research. You better research that, that candidate because not all Republicans in Idaho are created equal. Um, you know, you really have to do a, a deeper dive. And Mike Simpson is not invincible. Uh, he's down to just 54% in the Republican primary. Uh, that is not invincible territory. So, uh, do a little deeper dive. If you want to reach out to us, you can do that all via the website. We're working hard at it. The important thing also is it's only a two, really a two man race this time. Most of the times you have a crowded Republican primary and we get stuck with the incumbent over and over again. Well, in this, in this race, it's really just myself and, and Mike Simpson that have a viable chance. And I feel pretty good about it. We've got another uh, couple of weeks to go here and we're working hard and we, we thank you for your support, Misty. Oh, God. thank you so much for all you're doing. And I, I really do hope you're successful because it'd be at least one less in the swamp. Um, <laughs> Health Freedom Idaho cannot endorse, but I can say that um, I don't think anybody should be in office that long. And well, you, people you, can, you can endorse us, but others have. 
uh, including Ada, Ada, the largest county in Idaho, has formally endorsed us. I'm, I'm proud of that record. And I just came back from Bonneville, the second largest county in the district, and they also are, are endorsing Cleveland over Mike Simpson. I think that's a very telling thing here in Idaho in the congressional district when the two largest counties and three or four others have endorsed us. So we're, we're yeah. excited for that. Yeah, is awesome. You know, people talk about wanting term limits. They want to vote for term limits. But this is how you give term limits is you vote them out. This is this it. Is this is how the only the way people, to do it. It's how we the people do it. So That's right. we'll leave it right there, Scott. Thank you so much. I'll let you get back to campaigning and doing such a great job. Have a wonderful day. All right. Thank you, Misty. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye.